Barry Widow. Welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor to have you. You are a, you've had a wide ranging career, sir. That's one way to put it. I mean, I, 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 and another way is maybe I just can't decide what I want to do in my life. But I've been <laughs> been very uh, very fortunate to have been able to take the two things that I grew up loving as hobbies, which is video games and and movies, and be able to kind of pursue both of those professionally. I've been very lucky. So what do you want to do in your life at this point? Are you happy keeping that mix going? Do you want to go all in on one of them in the future? Well, at my age, I just turned 44. I don't know how much longer you can really decide how much, you know, how much more of my life do I really have to decide. When you grow up, Gary, what, what do you want to be? I'm a cranky old man these days. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm very, very happy to keep doing what I'm doing. And where, I, where I've been really lucky is the, 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 you know, the timing of my life and career, whatever you want to call it, came at a point when just as I was transitioning from, because I did games for a long time, into movies, as, as, as you of course well know, those two things are becoming more and more kind of symbiotic and, and compatible. So, you know, games are becoming, uh, you know, more cinematic in their storytelling. You know, we try to tell better stories in video games these days. And as someone who has spent a lot of time thinking about video games and thinking about storytelling in films, uh, it's, it's a great time to be someone like me, I guess, because I'm able to, you know, kind of speak both languages a little bit and help out with storytelling in video games. And when people want to take video games and turn them into movies, I'm able to, you know, kind of help out with that as well. It's It's been great. So where'd you get your roots in storytelling? Where, How do you know so much about it? How does this whole journey start? I grew up in the UK. Uh, I was uh, a child of the, of the 80s. Uh, I just started watching. Oh my god! I just started today, Monday. Uh, MTV Classic is like. Have you seen this? Like, no. So what MTV are they doing? Is, like the MTV that I grew up with is back. They just. It's like a time machine. It's incredible. I don't think I'm ever going to change the channel again. Wait. Like, so it's not like just streaming on Twitch. They're just putting. No. The it's like thing so. On... What used to be VH. This is a massive digression. But That's what used fine. to be VH1 Classic has, as of today, been rebranded as MTV Classic, and it's like it's just like if you turned on MTV in the 80s or 90s. That and they just run really music. Good. Remember how we used to say, I was, oh, remember when MTV used to run music videos? That was so great. Well, you can, like, you can go back in time now and just watch all of that. And they have Beavis and Butthead and TRL and Headbangers Ball, all my, all my favorites from when I was uh, a kid growing up watching MTV. So now you're revisiting MTV and getting inspired and getting back to your roots? I'm feeling very retro right now. I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, this is a big thing, right? No Stranger Things and everything that's getting from the 80s is being rebooted. Like, it's like we want, we, it's, I don't, if we're just like dissatisfied with where we are now, maybe Trump is making everybody want to kind of regress to a time, you know, a simpler, happier time. I don't know. But uh, I'm certainly feeling that, that nostalgia. And that, and to answer your question, that is kind of how I uh, got into it. I never really did much in the way of kind of formal study of screenwriting or anything, of anything like that. I just, I loved, playing video games when I was a kid. I grew up in the 8-bit era. Uh, so that, let me think, what did I have first? I had like an Atari 2600. And then later I had, the, the, it's interesting, the paths when I grew up in the UK and the US are slightly different in that you guys kind of came up, you know, the, 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 the way through is kind of Atari, Nintendo or Sega or whatever, and you know, the console route, uh, or you know, some people, or the uh, you know, Apple II. In the UK, it's more, it was more Atari, Sinclair Spectrum, Commodore 64, uh, Amstrad, and we had some Nintendo and Sega, but they didn't really become a bigger deal until kind of the 16, 32-bit era. So I grew up playing a lot of 8-bit games, 16-bit games, and I grew up reading the magazines, and I wanted to be one of those guys. I wanted to be one of those little caricatures in the in the magazines that you would see kind of giving the games the thumbs up or the thumbs down. That, yeah. was, that was my dream. The idea of being paid to play and review video games seemed like a dream job. To me, so I would bust out little little game reviews on my my mechanical typewriter when I was. I'm so dating myself <laughs> on my mechanical mechanical typewriter, and would fold up the letter very neatly and mail them into Commodore User and Popular Computing Weekly and the magazines that were kind of around at the time. And eventually got a job right out of high school uh, reviewing Amiga games for Commodore User magazine. So that was kind of my first uh, foot in the door professionally in the games industry. Nice. And then you eventually went on to PC Gamer, right? Yeah, so I did. I, I, I worked on Commodore User and a bunch of other magazines through kind of the 8-bit and 60, uh, right as the 8-bit era was transitioning into the 16-bit era. And the PC was always kind of unofficially kind of considered part of that era. You know, you had the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, and the PC was kind of in there as well as a computer you could play games on. But right, it, it, it wasn't until kind of like the early 90s the PC started to come into its own more as you know, a dedicated games machine with its own hardware and the games were starting to get better and better. Uh, and I, were, I, I was the uh, deputy editor at the time in 1993 when they launched the original UK edition of PC Gamer. 
Uh, and shortly after that, I became the editor. And then they launched an American edition of PC Gamer. And I came over to um, uh, San Francisco to help launch the American edition of the magazine that I had helped start in the UK. Uh, and was originally only supposed to come out here for a year to kind of help with that transition. But kind of fell in love with California and always at the back of my mind, I was also kind of thinking, oh, I want to, I want to really want to do the screenwriting thing. And I've now kind of geographically got myself kind of nine tenths of the way <laughs> towards where I would want to be or need to be to really pursue that. Um, and so the, uh, I'm, you know, 20 years later, I'm still here. They never managed to successfully get rid of me. Hey, congratulations. So going from that UK based to US based, I'm curious how much of a cultural shift you noticed. I mean, you mentioned it already just in terms of taste back in those days, but did you have to realign yourself for a United States uh, based version of, you know, outlook on gaming? No, in terms of popular culture, I mean, part of the reason why I came out here is I always kind of felt like a greater affinity with that. I was very much a child of American popular culture growing up in the 1980s and 90s, as many kids of my generation were. I mean, we had we have our own great, uh, you know, sci-fi and, and you know, literature and, and popular culture as well. You know, I, I grew up as much as anyone on Doctor Who and Blake Seven and Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and all those great, uh, you know, kind of sci-fi staples. But for the most part, you know, we grew up like all kids around the world on largely American uh, exports like you know, Star Wars and Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and even the cheesier stuff like, you know, Knight Rider. I loved all that. So I loved all the old kind of Glenn A. Larson shows. And that's what I, I grew up thinking, I want to do that. And in the UK, there was ne there's never really been like a great mainstream genre um, base of entertainment. You know, we're very good on Downton Abbey and, you know, Wolf Hall and Brideshead Revisited and very serious shows. Uh, but I think we've always kind of a little bit, the, at least the powers that be have always kind of looked down their nose a little bit at kind of pure popular you know, culture, genre, sci-fi type entertainment. It's changed a little bit with the popularity of Doc 2. But when I was growing up, I felt like my chances of writing stuff like that um, was somewhat limited here in the UK. And so my the, the calculation to come to the US was was partly based on that. And I, in a, in a weird way, I kind of felt like I was coming home because I was coming to the place where all the stuff that I grew up loving was made and where there was just a, there was just a, it was more acceptable to be a geek and to be into that stuff I think in the US than it was in the UK. Yeah, were you pretty tight with uh, the British game development scene back when you were in the UK, UK then? A little bit, yeah. Um, I, I you know and, and again I'm going to date myself again when I uh, when I talk about you know um, uh, development uh, teams like the Bitmap Brothers and these you know the, these kind of great guys that kind of came out of the eight and and the, and the great thing is a lot of these guys are, are are still going you know once you a lot of g gaming really is I think for many a career for life so many of the of the game developers that I grew up uh, idolizing and then later kind of interviewing and working with in nineteen eighties and nineties are still going strong today they've risen to, you know kind of very you know important positions in the in the game industry so yeah I was um, the one thing I will say. When I talk about the UK being not quite as strong on, you know, kind of sci-fi and drawing entertainment as in the US, in the video in the video game space, that was not true at all. I actually think that uh, the, the the British had and continue to have a disproportionate the percentage of the greatest game developers and game development anywhere in the world. Why do you think that is? You know, I I, I don't know. I think I, I I tell you why I think partly why it was. You know, when I talked about those two different tracks, you know, how you guys mainly kind of grew up with, you know, the Nintendo and the Sega systems, those were closed systems, right? You could play those games, you could never really get in there and figure out like, you know, if you were curious about how to make a game yourself, it was very difficult to figure out like, where would you go, right? You would, you, maybe you could get an Apple II, or maybe you could get a PC, but those were very, very expensive things back then. We were very fortunate in the UK around the same time that we had geniuses like Sir Clive Sinclair, who gave us computers like the ZX Spectrum, and you know the Commodore 64, which you can actually get in and program. They were open systems; you could learn basic. And again, you saw this in the US as well. But you know, many of your listeners won't be old enough to remember this. But I used to get the magazines that had the you know the type-in listings where you could where you would write in literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines of kind of basic computer code and get your own computer games running and up up on screen. And so if you were curious about not just playing the games, but how they were made and maybe making your own, I just think the kind of the hardware that was available and the price, it was so much cheaper. I mean, you could get a Spectrum uh, for the equivalent of a couple of hundred dollars, where a PC or an Apple II in America might cost you more like a thousand dollars. So there was just a lower bar for kids to have access to open systems that would allow them to tinker and play. And you know, so many of the great games that came out of that early generation of the 80s and 90s were literally written by 
one guy in his bedroom who learned how to code, learned how to program, and put together his own games. You didn't, and then and and then as the consoles became more dominant, that kind of went away, right? We didn't. The idea of like one guy making a game um, went away for a long time, especially now that you know game budgets are you know two hundred million dollars, and you know you need hundreds of people working in teams. But it, what's interesting is it's kind of come back around again with the indie scene. You know, look at games that you play on Steam, and a lot of the, a lot of the great games that. Uh, you can go find, you know, in the independent scene are now once again just made by one, you know, either one guy or a team of very small guys who have a great idea, a low budget, some ability to, you know, throw together the graphics and the code themselves and they can do great things. It's interesting. So like that open system, do you think that's maybe why Europe in general is more focused on systems-based games or even strategy games, I think in mainland Europe mainly, uh, whereas I think of like, you know, in Japan, they're much more for uh, clean systems, tight, don't give too many options out there, but make it a hell of an experience. And you think that's just based on the hardware that those kids grew up with? Yeah, maybe so. It was always a little bit more kind of just kind of gritty, kit bashed, like what can you get up and running on a screen uh, in the UK? Because, you know, the resources were were very thin, but again, they were open. You know, there was nothing to stop you just, you know, yeah, again, just think about it. The system that you would buy, um, if you look at kind of parallel, you know, gamers in the UK and the US in say the late eighties, early nineties, they would have had either, you know, they had a couple of hundred bucks to spend. They would they would buy either a Nintendo, which again, which is just all input, mm-hmm. right? All you can do sorry, I should say all output. The game output's a game that you play and your input is limited to, you know, playing the game under the very strict rules you're given. And some people could find ways to kind of find exploits or hack, but there's very little you could do to kind of get under the hood and really feel like you could, you know, input into the game or start start to make your own. Whereas for the same cash in the UK, like again, a couple of hundred bucks, you could buy a Spectrum that had a full keyboard. It literally had all the programming commands, you know, written into the kind of little rubberized keys. And you could you know, you could just as easily make a game as uh, uh, load one up and play it. And so I just think there was there wasn't any kind of curiosity gap, I think you know, kids in the in in the U.S. were just as curious about how are these games made, how do I play them. They just weren't the tools at the same kind of user friendly price points available for kids to really explore that curiosity as we had in the U.K. Yeah. So looking back on your time at PC Gamer, are there moments with developers that really stand out to you as being like that was amazing and special? Like, who are some of the legends that you interacted with back in the day during the PC Gamer days? Yeah. We actually did it at one point. We did. I, I was. I, I one of the one of the things that was interesting about the time that, that I kind of came into uh, the kind of the magazine world was we were just starting to figure out that the guys that made the games were in many cases as interesting as the games. Um, and again, the question you know, that comes back to that essential curiosity, right? It's not just playing the game. It's like who was like, who came up with this? Like, this is so cool. This is so crazy. Like, I want to know who came up with this idea. And so, you know, we, it, it, this, this wasn't the case in the early days of video gaming. We just were happy to play the games and whoever made it, you might not even be able to find the name of the guy in the, you know, in the, in the instruction manual or anywhere on the packaging. But we started to want to learn about and, and, and in certain cases celebrate the people that made these these great games. Now, of course, we live in a world where there are, you know, rock star developers, right? I mean, really, you know, celebrity game developers who have earned that status through the great games that they've made. And we rightly kind of applaud and celebrate them for, you know, the contributions that they've made, you know, whether it's Cliff Blazinski or Hideo Kojima. I mean, these people are, you know, celebrities, rock stars in our, in our business. Um, you know, that would have been an insane, an insane idea 20 or 30 years ago. I think Sean Murray's um, carried home just with fans every night. He doesn't even need a car anymore from Hello Games and No Man's Sky. People just pick him up and celebrate him as a hero and march down the street at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And we, um, and uh, one of the last things I did during my tenure at PC Gamer was I used to be obsessed with, well, not obsessed, but I always used to love and still love when Vanity Fair does those very elaborate Hollywood issues where they get all the Hollywood stars to come together for a big kind of Annie Leibovitz, uh, you know, photo shoot, and it's all very glamorous, and you just kind of feel like, you know, it, it just feels very opulent and special. I look at all these, all these amazing people, and we, we celebrate these talents, and I felt that, you know, as much as we've come a long way in terms of doing the same thing for our game developers, we never really, really, really put the focus on them in the same way. And let's be honest here, many game developers are not Hollywood-type, you know, actors. They're not necessarily built to be in front of a camera, either physically or socially. Some are, maybe not so many, but you know, a lot of them come from a very geeky background where that's just not what they're cut out for. Some yeah. are not comfortable in the spotlight, but many are. And I wanted to do something similar uh, as that kind of, it was kind of a ripoff of the Vanity Fair Hollywood idea. We did a PC gamer issue called Game Gods, and we put together 25 of what we felt at the time 
were the most influential and the most interesting personalities in games. So, you know, we had Peter Molyneux and Richard Gann, not necessarily even just people that were popular at that moment that, that we felt had, you know, been popular in history, uh, you know, kind of lifetime achievement type people and also people that were still kind of rock stars today. So, you know, John, again, look at the name. It's funny how many of those names endure. Sid Meier, Richard Garriott, you know, Peter Molyneux, uh, Chris Roberts, um, you know, Roberta Williams, who just recently got you know, another uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, Gabe Newell, all these people who either, either or and, you know, in the past, present and future have made huge contributions uh, to gaming. And it was a lot of fun to put that together. And we felt that it was, you know, it's, it's something that PC Gamer has continued to do traditionally in the years ahead. And I think it's great, again, that, you know, uh, uh, in the, it's the only artistic medium, I think, for many, 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 many years, video games, is the only artistic medium where the artist was the least known part of the whole thing, right? We only mm -hmm. just kind of knew the whole process. We know who makes films. We know who the singers and the writers of songs are. We know who paints pictures. But for, for the longest time, we didn't know who was really behind the video games that we played. And now, uh, on many occasions, um, you know, certainly in cases in case the ones that kind of the cream that floats to the top, uh, we do. Like you said, No Man's Sky. Most people know who that guy is, right? Because they've followed it. And, and again, and I think, you know, some people have really embraced that, you know, people, again, people like Cliffy B, I think love it. They love being the rock oh, stars. Yeah. They love, right? <laughs> Whereas Sean Murray, I think hates all cameras. Agreement with me there. Oh yeah. No, Cliffy clearly loves it for sure. No, Cl and Cliffy is a terrific guy and he's very, very, and he's very, very smart as well. He understands that's now become part of his brand. And again, Hideo, right? He, he, yeah. he, he himself as a personality is as much a part of the appeal as the game's uh, himself, and so they have legit legitimately become rock stars. Um, and I think that's uh, you know when you when you look at the contribution they've made to games and popular culture as a whole, I think that's only right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people might say, "Oh, you get out of the gate too early, Kojima, with Death Stranding and whatnot, showing it three years before it's going to be ready." But he clearly just wants to. If be back that had in the been limelight. his first game, maybe so. But he's earned yeah. the right now, right? Hideo Kojima has reached a point in his career where the second there's even a rumor he's doing something new people are interested based on the fact that he's done all this great stuff in the past and that, that's how it works now people devour every tweet of him just tweeting out a picture of ramen that he's eating that afternoon it's like well this is what the game god's doing i'm staying yeah, tuned. and he's like palling around with jj and guillermo <laughs> del toro again it's like it's every they're all up here on the same level now yeah for sure so you said you wanted to become a screenwriter at some point did you want to write games as well or are you hoping just to leapfrog directly into hollywood at the time, I wasn't thinking about game writing because there really that really wasn't a thing back then. The idea of you know story, you know, you have to remember. I grew up in a time when, sorry Mario, the princess is in another castle. That was that was pretty much it. That was what game storytelling was, and we never really thought about it. And then we went through a period, uh, kind of the difficult kind of birth pangs of the CD-ROM interactive movie area, where we were trying to figure out ways to make games kind of look and feel more like movies using. You know the full motion video that we with you know we all remember sewer shark and you know night trap and these kind of very painful attempts to try and graft these two things together in in inelegant ways um but for the longest time as i remember even during you know, kind of the later years of my time on pc gamer in the late 90s story just wasn't something we necessarily thought a lot about i remember reading and editing many reviews where things such as um, well, the game doesn't have a great story, but what do you expect as a video game? That would be a mm -hmm. standard comment in a video game review. We just didn't have high expectations for story. Imagine that now, right? You couldn't get away with that anymore. The t times have changed to the point where enough games, whether it be you know the work of Valve or Blizzard or Telltale, so many rock stars, so many developers are out there now. Uh, Naughty Dog is obviously a brilliant example, doing so much great storytelling in their games. It's been demonstrated time and time again that story can work in games and it makes games better when it is does well when, when it does do well or, or sorry when it is done well that it's there's no excuse for not doing it anymore if it, you know, obviously with a kind of a puzzle type game you don't necessarily need in everything but in a game that um if there is an opportunity for a story or there is a story and it's not great you will get dinged for that now uh as much as you would if you had a, a bad story in a movie or a television show so mm -hmm. the expectation uh, has very much changed. Like I, I personally was really disappointed by Star Wars Battlefront. I really wanted to play that, but he did, the fact that they didn't put a single player campaign in there, when you know story is kind of the foundation that all of Star Wars is kind of built on, I was really disappointed. Running around just kind of randomly shooting people in these context-free battles was not as much fun for me as feeling like I was playing a character in a in a you know in a in a narrative campaign where you know I felt like what I was doing had some. Uh, consequence. And so yeah. 
uh, I didn't think about it then. But I do think about it a lot now because you know people come to me now and they want to you know put stories in games and make them better. And I've done some work in in the past on on games where stories have have worked successfully. And so it is now something that it's no longer just a line item at the bottom of a, of a development checklist where they say, "Oh, well, who's the least busy?" You know, you can do the story <laughs> now. You know, they're bringing in either bringing in professional storytellers from outside or increasingly. Um, you know, developing and building up their own storytelling departments and their own institutional storytelling knowledge inside big time uh, development companies and, and, you know, paying as much attention to it as the game design or the sound design or the, or the visuals or any, or any other key element. Well, what do you think about some of those early games that people really herald as like champions of storytelling in the 90s? Do you think that they hold up today? I mean, people, maybe like Final Fantasy IV is a good example or Final Fantasy VI. You think yeah, I mean, still I think well, I, Final Fantasy is not the best example to to ask me about because I never really Final Fantasy is just a world. The, the the whole JRPG thing is just a world that's always been slightly culturally impenetrable sure. to me. But I, you know, I actually would would say that the Japanese, I think, have 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 been thinking about this and trying to do this longer than we have in the Western world. I think Japanese games have always uh, made uh, strong attempts to tell story maybe that's maybe there's a greater storytelling culture i don't know but um you know it's very rare to see again even sorry mario the princess of the castle even at its most basic level is is there is some narrative context there right you understand what it is that you're trying to do um and so i do think that both in the east in, in the east and west in the last 20 years we've seen a massive acceleration uh in trying to get this right and i think what we've mostly seen is failed experiments again if you go back and look at you know kind of that cd rom era uh, and you look at stuff like Sewer Shark or you look at stuff, a lot of the games that I used to cover when I was editing PC Gamer in the mid to late 90s. Um, what what we saw was an attempt to try to make games feel more like movies without really understanding that games aren't movies and movies aren't games. They're two very different things and story can work in both. But trying to just you know uh, bring live actors onto a stage and film them as though they're in a, uh, as, as they are in a film and then you know have those kind of workers cut scenes doesn't necessarily work. I think Valve made. I think the first time I saw it work really really beautifully was in um, whatever year it would have been. Was it ninety? I want to say ninety eight. I don't remember when the first Half Life came out. Yeah, I think it's ninety eight. So blown away by it uh, because it told a story in a way that was so. Um, enmeshed with the language of games, right? There were no, if you think about it, there's no cutscenes, right? At no point do you ever step out of Gordon Freeman's body. Everything is experienced through your uh, kind of, you know, first person point of view. And the way that scripted events work, you know, with the, you know, th- you know things are literally, it's like going through a Pirates of the Caribbean, right? There are things waiting in the shadows, literally waiting for you to kind of walk in and trigger a scripted event that will surprise you. We take that for granted now. At the time that Half Life was doing it, that was totally new. Um, and to and to be able to co- to convey a whole sense of a world and a narrative, and you felt like you were doing something, and you understood what was going on and what the stakes were, without having to use what at the time had been those kind of traditional, old-fashioned, you know, kind of multi-camera cutscenes. <coughs> was a big step forward in realizing that games are their own language and they don't mm-hmm. have to just copy films to uh, tell a story. We, you know, we actually have more interesting ways of doing it. And of course now what we see is games in some ways going beyond film and television and be able to um, tell stories that film and TV never could by allowing the audience to actually become part of the story by making decisions and saying, saying well, I want this character to live or die or I want the story to go left or right and have branching narratives and as an audience, um, you know, really, really feeling like they're engaged and part of the story. In film and TV, you know, we always try and we're always trying to think of every trick we can to make the audience feel engaged and to care about what's happening on the screen, even though you know they're not part of the story. Mm-hmm. But by making a player part of the story, by you know part of the you know part of the narrative that's unfolding, um, you you can get people uh, really, really caught up in uh, in the action. When I worked on The Walking Dead. Uh, oh my god! I, so I was I, I I was the consultant across the first season of The Walking Dead Telltale game. I wrote episode four, mm-hmm. and you know the way that those games are developed episodically is, uh, you know we're working on episode four while people are playing episode two. The game's out there in the in the world, and so we're getting live feedback on you know the episodes are already out there while we're still finishing up the season. And you try not to let that get too much in your head, right? Because you've got a plan. You want to you know where the story is. We always knew how the story was going to end. You look at feedback along the way, and maybe you make little tweaks, but you would never make a major change. But people got really, really, really invested in this idea of as Lee protecting Clementine, right? They became really, really attached to Clementine. And so when I came on 
uh, episode four, I got people sending me like quite serious letters saying like, you better not let anything happen to Clementine. <laughs> like they were, they were really, really protective of her and they were really worried that something bad was going to happen. And I think part of that is because they're not just watching someone else try to protect her. They actually, li they literally have a hand in protecting her and making the kind of choices that will decide what happens to her. And so you see this level of kind of audience engagement and, and, and caring about the characters in a way that when done well, I think go, can go beyond anything you see in a film or a TV show. Yeah. So I'm curious about when you first went over uh, to Telltale, what was that thing, what that was like? I, in my mind, tell me if this is a stretch. I always envisioned it kind of like, you know, you hear the stories about Pixar and like Joss Whedon coming in and doing a draft of Toy Story. And then they'd be like, oh, it's nice to have a screenwriter here to tell us maybe some more Hollywood style principles. Do you feel like you well, played that role at Telltale or what was no, your No, it was quite there? the opposite. First of all, I'm not Joss Whedon. Far, <laughs> far from it. Um, and Telltale at the time was not Pixar, although they are get although a lot has changed and they are actually getting closer to becoming, I think, kind of the Pixar of, uh, of the video game world. When I came in uh, during the first season of The Walking Dead, they were a very, very small company. You go visit them now, they are in a much bigger office with many, many, many more people and they're doing Minecraft and Batman and Game of Thrones and all of these things that exploded out of the success of The Walking Dead. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you, is that it, it, it's, it's funny you use that example because the reality was exactly the opposite. Um, uh, you know, Pixar saying to Joss Whedon, what can you teach us? And by the way, that actually is the way Pixar operate. Um, I, I, I've, I've spoken at Pixar a couple of times and it's amazing to see um, how they how they kind of go about their business. Even though you think of Pixar right as master storytellers, they are brilliant at what they do. They can make us cry. You know, some of the some of the most emotional times I've ever spent in a movie theater are with with Pixar films. Yeah. So you think, my God, these guys like they've got it down. They know everything, and yet they constantly invite storytellers and people from other fields to come in and talk to them because they feel like they can never stop learning. Like if they get to the point, and I would say this to any writer or someone in any creative field, if you ever get to the point where you say, I've cracked it, there's nothing more for me to learn, that is the beginning of your downfall. And the fact that Pixar never got to that point, I think, is, 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 is a good illustration of why they continue to just get better and better and better because they're always, always learning. So um, learning and then like testing and iterating as well. Is that another big lesson from Pixar? Yeah, that? well, I mean, and, and Pixar will throw away an almost completely finished film if they feel like it's not what they want it to be and they'll go back to square one. I mean, they're very, 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 um, they're, they are kind of their own harshest critics. Uh, in the case of Telltale, though, uh, it was the exact opposite of them saying to me, you know, what can we learn from you? I really went in and, and found myself learning a lot from them. The two, they're not at Telltale anymore, but the two guys that were kind of the story leads on The Walking Dead, Sean Vanham and, and Jake Rodkin, uh, when I would sit in the room with them and you, and you break, when I say break, it means just kind of figure out the, when you break the story of, a, of, a, of an episode of a Telltale game, it works much the same way as you do it in television. A bunch of people sit around you know, a big conference table and you have a whiteboard and there's usually one or two guys that are kind of running the room and are in charge of kind of guiding the conversation and you figure out, <coughs> excuse me, first what your overall season story is your season arc and then you kind of break it down into episodes well you know what's the story what are the story beats of this particular episode and i would sit around the table along with you know the four or five other writers and game you know and you have game developers in there as well the actual game designers because you know you can have a great story idea but then a game designer will put his hand up and say wait how's that supposed to work in the game because i actually have to figure out how to make that interactive so there's a lot of um uh kind of in interdisciplinary conversation happening about an idea that might be great for game design, might not be great for story and vice versa. And balancing those two things is very difficult. So the reality was I ended up learning a ton about um, developing stories for interactive um, uh, games from Sean. And, and Sean and Jake, of course, went on to you know even greater things with Firewatch, which is, which is tremendous. Uh, and so I learned a ton from them. And now people, because I was associated with The Walking Dead, I've had a lot of companies come to me since trying to figure out you know, what's the telltale secret source? Like, we want to do that now. We want to care about story. And I would just say to them, well, first of all, you're already halfway there in wanting to care about the story. Yeah. Um, and then the second, it, it, again, it's different for everyone because the telltale is very much a story-led experience. Some, some people say, well, are they even games? Who cares? Who cares what you call? I don't care what, na what label you put on them. As long as you're having a great time experiencing it, I really do think of The Walking Dead as like, maybe it's a game, maybe it's an interactive TV series, but whatever it is, we all just know that we love experiencing and telltale have, have developed i think you know almost an entirely new hybrid form of entertainment where we don't know what kind of label to put on it so yes the, my the short answer to your question is 
They learned nothing from me, but I learned very, very much from them. <laughs> How tough was it to apply lessons that you learned to Telltale to other game companies? Like we, what you said, I mean, there's such different styles of games. So when, I don't know, a Microsoft or a Sony comes to you and says, hey, can you help us write this game? Could you carry over that many lessons directly from Telltale? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are. I mean, to some extent, yeah. Again, with Telltale, it's kind of as a if you want to write story in video games, Telltale is kind of the you're in the lap of luxury there. In that, it's it's very much a story first company. They do care very much about game design as well, but you've probably got more latitude there to have major creative decisions guided by story rather than by game design. You go to you go into uh, more traditional game like worlds, whether it's you know, Halo or Grand Theft Auto or whatever. You know, pick pick a you know a big budget kind of game. Um, and story is still considered in very important. Again, you know, more important now that we've seen it work really well. Other other companies really want to get it right, but they don't necessarily have the same luxury of having story lead the experience. Like for example, I did some consultancy on Halo Five. Oh, great! After okay. on on Guardians after Telltale, and I would I would sit in the room and in my naivety pitch story ideas where I was, oh, wouldn't it be great if this character got stranded, you know, on this thing? And they would constantly remind me that won't work because our game design has to support four-player co-op all the time. Oh my so God. you cannot do a story. So any any story strand that you're telling, we need to be able to have four characters there. And so, that I mean, that's just one example of the kind of game design restriction. It's an additional restriction on your storytelling. And this is why I often tell people, I think, you know, writing for games is by far... The mo it's, it's the least celebrated area right now in writing. Right, you can write a great script for a video game, but you'll probably be less noticed and recognized for that than you would be if you wrote a great script for a movie or a television show. Um, and yet, yeah, it's the hardest hill to climb. Not simply, both in terms of volume, because when you think about all kind of the branching dialogue, like an episode of you know the Walking Dead TV show is you know uh, you know an hour long. Right, take out the commercials, forty four minutes. A, a, a typical script is a page a minute. So a typical script for a Walking Dead TV show is probably around 50 pages. A typical script for my episode of The Walking Dead was about 10 times that mm -hmm. because you have to write every different branch, right? Every parallel reality, every choice that you can possibly make. And the game player only sees one version of it as they go, you know, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, and they see that particular part. But you still have to write every part that they didn't see because you don't know which they're going to pick, and so yeah. all of the branching dialogue and all the on all the interdependent dialogue. So, well, if you said that to this character in this earlier scene, that sets a flag that means he either likes you or doesn't like you later, and it means this scene either will or won't play. Logistically, it is an absolute just migraine-inducing nightmare. Not like I said, not just in volume, but mostly in terms of complexity. The vo the, the episode of The Walking Dead that I worked on. Uh, there's a without spoilers for anyone who may not still have played it. There's a thing that happens at the end where you, as Lee have to ask all of the other members of the group to come with you and help you on a personal thing that you need to do. And at that point, the game is comp is remembering and taking into account every flag that you've tripped, not just over that episode, but over every episode that you played in the whole season, and, and coming up with a calculation based on uh, do I, do I, I, am I favorably disposed towards Lee at this moment? Because he, maybe he helped me earlier or maybe he didn't, or maybe he said something nice to another character that I don't like. And that's why I don't like him. Yeah. Maybe I do like Lee, but this guy's going to help him and I don't like him. And so, and so you should see the flow chart for it. Is it, it really exciting? Some... Like in that story pitch that you talked about on the whiteboard, when you see like, oh my God, they're going to come to a head in this fourth episode and they're going to have to choose which characters to align themselves with. Do you see that as like, oh man, this is going to be the sweet. At time, you go, ha, 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 and you're rubbing your hands together and thinking about all the, all, and all the potential. When the time comes to actually make it work, it looks more like an equation from Goodwill Hunting <laughs> and you're just tearing your hair out because it's so... It's so tricky to yeah. make it. So yeah, every, remember, yeah, every single version of this that the player picks, and there are I don't know how many, you know, many, many countless um, uh, variations. They all have to work, right? The game can never break, and you can never have just like a boring or an unsatisfactory outcome. Everything has to be kind of equally satisfying in its own way, depending on what you pick. Yeah, and that's a tremendous burden. It's tremendously difficult to do. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's difficult to tell an engaging story, even in a purely linear passive medium like film or television. There's all kinds of rules you have to learn and it's a craft that we never stop learning. Uh, you add all the burden of player agency and interactivity and the players trying to break the story. There are some players that played all the way through The Walking Dead without having Lee ever say anything. Because that's an option, right? You, yeah. can just, you, can, you, can, you can just do the silent option. And there's like whole silently playthroughs 
on YouTube where you can watch it. And it's kind of, it, you know, it's weird, but it kind of works in its own way. It's just like, it's kind of oddly kind of mute character. This kind of strong silent type. Um, and so you have to, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to keep the house of cards from collapsing. And you learn that through play testing. You learn, it, there's all kinds of things that you do to try and, um, uh, you know, make it a strong foundation. The great thing about it is when you do see the game, when, when it works, and I remember watching the you know kind of the loot, the YouTube you know the Let's Play videos of the Walking Dead episodes. When it does work, and you create a moment that people feel truly invested in, um, the way that they react, like I said, they feel so much more engaged. You go, no, because like they feel like they had a hand in something terrible that happened. Like that was my fault. It's so satisf satisfying for us as the authors of the work to see the outcome to see oh yeah. it worked it played like that moment landed the way that we wanted to but to get there yeah it's tremendously tremendously difficult which is why you know so many of us are still uh so many companies are still figuring out how to make story working games i think we're still very much kind of in the the silent movie era of, of video game storytelling sure so you talk about how you know it's maybe the least appreciated field for writing is games writing uh do you feel like your work on walking dead move the needle in Hollywood? Do Hollywood executives respect your work in the game industry? Does it come up a lot? It, com it, it, it comes up a little bit in terms of, um, you know, when you meet the executives who work in film and television, they're all game players now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're all, um, you know, it's a younger industry now. It's a younger business. Like many of the, uh, like if you go into, a, you know, a, an office of a, of a senior production executive or a VP kind of guy and, in Hollywood, there's a good chance there's an X Xbox or a PlayStation hooked up in their office. A, because they want to stay abreast of all this stuff. They're looking for like what the next, you know, property is or the next thing that they can learn from or adapt or, or license. But they're also just playing the games. They're playing Halo. They're playing GTA. They love the games. Um, and so, yeah, like it's noticed. Um, I don't know if it moved the needle uh, for me necessarily that much career-wise. Uh, it certainly did in games because, again, where that, where that is very, very much looked at, after The Walking Dead came out, I had a lot of people in games you know, from Microsoft and other companies saying, can you help us as well? Mm -hmm. um, and, and honestly, I, felt, I would say to them, like, to be honest with you, I'm not really the guy. I just came in and helped a little bit. But like Sean and Jake and these other guys, those are the real smart guys that you should be uh, talking to. But they, you know, they want you know, whatever piece of it uh, that they can get. So in games, certainly, yeah, I've done a lot more consultancy and a lot more work in games. And I will say that, that The Walking Dead in general has – massively moved the needle i think you know if, if you're an observer uh such as yourself of the games industry you will I, i'm sure you'll agree you've seen kind of a seismic change towards people wanting to uh improve the storytelling in their games since stuff like the walking dead came along oh yeah for sure no doubt about it i mean one game of the year on the Keeleys and whatnot, like uh, definitely. The Keeleys is that. that what they're called? Now? I don't know. I forget what the hell he called it. It changes every year. I feel I like I bet he came up with that. We should call him the Keeleys. <laughs> oh come on, Jeff. That's my big face on a gold platter. Uh, so I always thought that. I, don't, I always, I always used to think about that. Like, don't you think like when, like when Bon Jovi was a garage band, and they're just sitting around there, like Richie Sambora and those guys, and um, and they're like coming up with the name of the band, and John Bon Jovi says, "You know what we should call it." Bon Jovi. <laughs> Didn't think everyone else was like, fuck off, John. <laughs> why, why is it all about you? How about we call it Kojima Productions, everybody? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And we put the name a thousand times in Metal Gear Solid 5. So, speaking of Hollywood, then, I'm curious what you think about nerd momentum within Hollywood. Is it just here to stay forever? Uh, <laughs> are we in a bubble of a game film adaptations? Is it going to recede away? I feel like this year in particular, it just seems like it's really being thrown in our face. I don't think any trend lasts um, forever. You know, there was a point where all we made was Westerns, right? right. That Hollywood pr was pretty much just made Westerns. And now Westerns aren't really made so much anymore, occasionally, but, you know, they're not what they were. We are certainly and have been, you know, for a decent amount of time now, like 20 years, I would say, very, very much catering to, you know, the nerd audience. And again, it's a business calculation. Uh, based on anything based on well-known material is considered, you know, for, for a risk averse Hollywood. This is why we don't see a lot of kind of big budget original, uh, you know, science fiction movies type made, you know, big, you know, J guys like JJ and Chris Nolan can get those things made. But for the most part, if I were to write a big expensive, uh, you know, science fiction script based on, you know, all, you know, all new characters, no one you've ever heard of, it's great story, probably would not get made. Hang on, didn't you do that and that kind didn't of it get made? That, you know, but everyone knows who Spider-Man is. Everyone uh -huh. knows who Batman Even non-nerds, right? Everyone knows who um, Spider-Man is. And that, that was the genius of the J.J. 
reboot of Star Trek, right? Was like, we got to go back to the characters that everybody knows. Everybody knows Kirk and Spock, right? We all know those guys and you don't have to be a geek to know them. Um, and so that's how you get more people uh, to come to the party. Because the, tr the, the truth is the geeks alone aren't enough, right? You can have all the Spider-Man fans in the world show up to the new Spider-Man movie, but if it's just them, it's not nearly, that movie bombs, it's not nearly enough. You've got to get people who, you've got to make it cool for the people that don't necessarily read the comics or, you know, the majority, the reality is the majority of people who go see Captain America Civil War or whatever have never picked up a Captain America book in their life. But or the movie made it cool yeah. for them. Or Deadpool's a good example. Like, I remember arguing before that film came out, like, no one cares about Deadpool. Like, it is just a very I vocal be minority. You, before, the movie came, before the movie came out, I did not really know who Iron Man was. <laughs> I, had not, I did not, I, I knew that he was a guy in a suit, but I didn't know he, I, I, I'd never really heard the name Tony Stark. Like, I, I, because I've never been like a mate, like a really kind of deep in my bones comic book guy. Yeah. I remember when they were going to make the Green Lantern movie, I had to talk to, I asked a friend of mine, who's really into comics. I was like, okay, so explain to me what Green Lantern is and like how, like what are his power, like how does it all work? And he explained it to me and I was like, okay, now tell me the real version because you're joking, right? That can't <laughs> be the real, that's not what Green Lantern does. He's got like fl green flubber that comes out of his ring and he can turn it into anything and there are these like intergalactic space smurfs that he works for. Like, I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take any of it seriously. And so much of it is hard to take seriously, right? And that's why I think you've seen DC and Marvel you know the the movies are not as crazy as the comics, right? They're a bit more grounded. A lot of a lot of the more, I mean, fair play to them. You know, Guardians of the Galaxy and some of the other Marvel movies have really embraced the silliness yeah. of it all. DC, I think, has gone much more grounded. Like we have to pretend this is all real and it's very gritty. And what are the political ramifications? Like you can't just have Superman going around doing good stuff anymore, and it's all going to be very politically complicated now. Um, and I think that's a shame uh, uh, to some degree. But yeah, it's um, I. I I don't know if, if the comic movies are going to be around forever. Like I said, no trend ever really is. Mm -hmm. I think they've probably got, I don't know, 10 or 15 more good years guaranteed. And then sooner or later, like even I'm getting a little bit tired, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the Marvel movies. And I, I, and I thought I actually think uh, Wonder Woman and JLA look really good. I'll go see them. But even I'm like, when there's four or five or six coming out over the course of a summer, you know, I don't know if I want to see them all. Like something's got to give. It's it's almost too much. So we are definitely at a saturation point. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next few years. But that's still the momentum that you're finding. That's where the business is. Is just adaptations. Like you announced Mouse Guard. You're writing, right? Yeah. So I'm working on Mouse Guard, which is a and, and that was a challenge to get made as well because it's a much lesser known piece of material. It's very very well known within the world of you know kind of certain comic book geeks, but it's not Spider Man. It's not Batman. And again, those are the characters that you're generally seeing. Um, you know, adapted, right? You know, super. You know, it took a lot. It takes this long just to get Wonder Woman, who is very, very well known. Uh, and I think where Marvel has been very, very clever is now using the success that they've had of the major heroes. You know, the Captain America, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, and and using those as a as as kind of a backdoor to get the lesser known ones like Black Panther and these guys in and now mm -hmm. they're and now they're going to have big movies. So their strategy has been very, very, very clever. Um, but yeah, I mean. In terms of like just adapting non you know material and not really favoring original films and wanting to be risk averse and 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 you know adapting books and things that we, things that we can say if the movie flops well it wasn't our fault you know there was the audience was there you know we it wasn't like we took a risk on some highly unoriginal or highly unknown piece of material so Hollywood's always going to do that I don't think that, I don't think that's a trend that's just a reality of Hollywood when there's so much money at stake. Hollywood is weirdly kind of now like a secondary, somewhat vampiric business. And they don't generally bring a lot of big ideas to the table anymore. They find great ideas that have proven themselves in other mediums, and then they will make the big razzmatazz version of it. But only after certain spreadsheets and pie charts have been satisfied so that they feel like they can make the financial decision to spend all this money and not lose their jobs. But like pre-Star Wars, I feel like you found success with original stuff. I mean, you wrote Book of Eli and After Earth. Like those got pushed through the system somehow, right? Well, I mean, so with Eli, I was very lucky uh, in that, you know, I didn't expect that movie to be made. And that was an original piece. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of commercial strikes against it. It's got, you know, religious themes and it's very, very violent. It probably needs to be R-rated. Um, you know, it's kind of a small film. There, are, there aren't like big explosive action things in it. Um that was a piece that I actually mostly just kind of wrote as, you know, what they call a calling card, where as a writer you say, look, I don't expect you to make this, but this is what I'm capable of and this is the kind of thing I like to write. Uh -huh. do, you do you have something like a comic book adaptation or something that 
that this you know qualifies me for once you've seen this and liked my writing I never had a reasonable expectation that it would get made but it was an idea that I was very passionate about and wanted to write and we just got lucky that you know it found its way to Joel Silver and Denzel and again once someone who has the ability to move the needle takes an interest you know I, I often I often tell people it doesn't matter how crazy or a long shot your script might seem it's no, it, it's only ever one Peter Jackson or James Cameron or JJ or Del Toro away from getting made. You just that one guy believes, loves, and goes, "Oh my God, this is the movie I wanted to make all my life." Then it's getting made because they have the ability to 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 move the needle. Yeah. Um. And with with After Earth, that was something where the needle mover was there to begin with. Will hired me to work on the movie. Oh wow. And I remember it's it's funny. It's funny you should ask. I remember this uh, very specifically. This moment. And obviously the movie, you know, the movie kind of came out. Um, Kind of weirdly, not exactly what there were so many like cooks in the kitchen that ended up becoming this thing that was like I don't think any one person's vision, and that's the danger of like collaborative filmmaking sometime in Hollywood. But I remember saying to Will, and I again coming to the table as a screenwriter, who you have to remember for for every Eli that I've had made, which is one, I've written twenty, thirty other scripts that you will never see. So the batting average is actually not that great. You only see the successes. You don't see all the scripts, you know, kind of piling. Uh, you know, gathering dust piling up on my on my shelf over here. <laughs> uh, but I remember I remember saying to Will because we come from totally different worlds. You know, he's a immensely successful actor, one of the biggest stars in the world, and I'm me. And uh, I said to him, he's got this is going to be huge. We're going to have aliens and spaceships and all this cool. And there's a big spaceship crash. And it's going to be awesome. And uh, you know, clearly talking about like a big you know 150 200 million dollar movie. And it's an original piece. It's just an idea that he had. And I remember sitting there thinking, and eventually saying to Will like. This is crazy, right? Like, because he he financed the development of the script himself. This was all done outside of the studio system, and he said we're just going to take it, and then we're going to the whole package. Me as the producer and the star, and your script and everything else. We take it to to, to the studio and, and we make it. And um, so it wasn't just his belief; like he had real money invested in writing the script and developing it and doing having concept art and all this whole presentation yeah. for the studio. And I remember saying, like, this is a big risk. Like, what if the studio says no and doesn't want to make your movie? And he wasn't joking at all. It was a sincere moment. He looked at me as like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> because he does, because Will is someone that, you know, I don't think he may not, I don't think he'd ever heard no up until that the point. You know, as a big movie star, if he's, if he attaches himself to a script, it is instantly getting made. Um, and so he's, and, and so he goes to the studio and says, look, this is a passion project for me. I just did, you know, your latest Men in Black and I'll do the next big franchise movie. This is how Chris Nolan does it as well. You know, yeah. Inception. One for Inception them, one for you. Type of thing. Under, under almost any other circumstances, a movie of that size and scale and ambition. And again, you know, people are reading the script. And like, wait, so they're inside their heads and dreams within dreams. And this is all very complicated. And I don't, like, it's, I, you know, if anyone else had written that script, it might, as, as great a script as it was, very well might just be another script kind of, kind of sitting on a pile and, Showing up in one of those annual, you know, internet lists of you know Hollywood's best unmade scripts. You see them all yeah, the time. Exactly. But you know, because it was Chris Nolan, and because he's in business with Warner Brothers, who love him and want him to continue making movies for them forever. I think it was a a simple equation of look, you want me to make the next Batman movie, fine, but you'll make this first, and and it, and so it gets done. Yeah. And we all dream of kind of getting to that level, right, where you where you've had enough success that the studio doesn't feel like they're taking a risk on you anymore, right? Chris Nolan now is the brand, right? You'll go see a Chris Nolan movie, right? Just because it's Chris Nolan. Or, yeah. you know, and again, you can say the same with Spielberg or Del Toro or JJ, the same kind of five or six names coming up, this handful of people or Coen brothers for me, where I don't need to know what it's about. I just need to know that they made it and I'll go see their new, their new thing. Could be an original idea, could be a comic book. I don't care if it's set in ancient Rome or the Wild West or the modern day. If it's the Coen brothers, I'm going. Yeah, for sure. Um, and for the studio, and that's, that's kind of a creative, for creatively, I don't feel like I'm taking a risk. I know I'm going to enjoy whatever they make. With someone like Chris Nolan or JJ, the studio knows that they're almost certainly going to make money mm -hmm. with whatever he brings them. Yeah, and so the and so it doesn't matter if it's an original or a or a franchise anymore. Um, you know, they're in the business now. I think of creating franchises. Right, Cloverfield's on its way to being a franchise now. That's a brand, and that started as an original. Yeah. I, I, I you know I use this example all the time. You got to remember in 1975, Star Wars. Well, the Star Wars, as it was back then, was just a weird script sitting on someone's desk and getting people all over Hollywood saying, "What the hell is this?" There's a there's these robots and a and a talking bear and this guy's a robot, but he also does magic. Like, what is what episode is four? Here? What the hell? No, that was just a weird science fiction script 
from a, from the guy that had just made American Graffiti, and you know, famously, of course, people all over town said no, and it was Alan Ladd and the guys at Fox that said, okay, we'll we'll take a chance on it, and now it's obviously one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, cinematic you know franchise of all time. But it, whether it's video games, whether it's movies, whether it's television, every big franchise. You know, Fast and the Furious, Star Wars, Star Trek, you name it, started with somebody taking a risk on an original idea that had not at that point been proven. I feel like the games industry sees you and your career is like, hey, local boy does good. Uh, coming from the gaming roots and now writing one of the biggest films of the year, Star Wars Rogue One. I mean, I want to know, is it as satisfying as it seems to the outside world to land gigs like that? No. Okay, um, great. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's no hope. Yes okay. and no. But I'll, 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 let, let me qualify that. Part part of the problem is that you know we become people who become writers. I think become writers because they're deeply damaged psychologically, emotionally, whatever. They're not social animals. They're not good in a room. The best way for them to for them to express themselves is kind of by proxy, which is like they're going to write write their feeling, put their feelings down onto the page privately by themselves. And then hand that to someone and run away, right? Rather than kind of engage with them directly. That's kind of how writers express themselves. And so we are deeply insecure. Uh, we all suffer from, you know, what we call imposter syndrome, that idea that, you know, we're all frauds and we can't really do this and, you know, we get lucky. Um, I was very lucky early in my career to meet Frank Darabont, you know, who wrote, created the Shawshank Redemption, one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. And I, um, early on in my career, I got to hang out with him and he kind of did a bit of mentoring with me and I talked to him about, the the, um, the 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 paralysis, the terror of the blank page. When you look at the blank page, and you're like, well, like, I, okay, here we go. I'm going to create. I'm going to write something, and then you're just going to go, ah, uh, and that's what. And so you go clean the fridge or do something else because you don't really want to write. It's so scary. And Darabont, I, I expected him to say, like, right, okay, here's how you get past that. And he said to me, I know it's terrible, isn't it? I have that as well. I was like, what? No, but. I, I, but the, the fraud, like people are going to think that I'm a fraud and I can't do this. You wrote the Shawshank Redemption. Like, doesn't that prove not only to the whole world, but to you that you can ever do that? You can, that you can do this and not, not just can do it, but you're great at it. He's like, no, you just think that you got lucky that one time. And the next time, you know, the truth will be revealed to you and the whole world that in fact you suck. Um, and I remember thinking, I still, I, I don't know if that makes me feel better or worse. The idea that, well, even the greats, suffer from that right that's kind of comforting to know but at the same time it kind of sucks to know that you could become one of the greats but you'll still never be free of that internal you know nightmare you know that voice at the back here saying this is the one this is the one where they find out that you suck this happens every single time and it never goes away and i, I suspect a lot of people that are you know writers or want to be writers who have tried this are wrecking i suspect recognizing what i'm saying right now because i think all people that have the creative impulse have it. Uh, it's a very real thing. Uh, and yeah, Star Wars and everything else, it, you know, there, there is a certain pragmatic part of you that goes, well, look, people wouldn't keep hiring you if they didn't think you could do this. Uh, but it, uh, that's barely kind of what sustains you. Uh, but no, for the, for the, but for the most part, it's, um, uh, a, a fairly tortured, existence of you know you finish the one thing but then the black that next blank page is waiting for you and the moments in the sun the kind of the moments that make it feel like it's all worth it like when you're on a red carpet uh and you know there's flash bulbs going off and you actually get to feel like you have that kind of vinnie chase moment i've got to do that a few times okay. right? and you go you just for that moment you allow yourself to kind of let the kind of that moment in the movie you know where the where the where it slows down sure and the and the voiceover comes up, how did I get here? You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you, you do, those moments do exist in real life or when you see your name come up in, you know, 30 foot high letters at the end of the movie, in that moment, you kind of go, it was all worth it. But it's kind of like, I don't know, I guess it's kind of like an orgasm in that it's very pleasurable, but it's really, but it goes away pretty quickly and then you just kind of like, well, now what? I got to go do I, <laughs> I got to go do now, but now, you know, I got to go figure out, you know, how to have the next one and that, you know, maybe this. <laughs> and then there's rebels. I mean, I think that's post post coitus, a cuddling, I think is how that works. Yeah. So yeah, like, <laughs> that's right. So yeah, after I, uh, after I was done with Rogue One, I, um, uh, Lucasfilm asked me to come work on rebels for a while. And I, uh, actually the first stuff of mine, uh, that you'll see my name on, um, where there is star Wars 
uh, in the Star Wars world will be will be Rebels, the animated series on Disney XD. That the third season starts this fall, and I got to uh, write a few episodes of that. And again, be in that. The, the the real fun there again is again is just being in that room. Oh yeah, with with a bunch of guys who all love and care about Star Wars, and uh, Dave Filoni, who you know worked on Clone Wars with George directly, and now is and now runs Rebels, who is one of the great one of the truly great Star Wars minds. Like no one knows, not I'm not, not not even just talking about the trivia, but like just understanding like what the like what Star Wars is and isn't. You know, like just what makes it. That was the big challenge, right, with Episode Seven. Is like when you everyone goes and sees it. And, you know, some people, many people, myself included, frankly, you know, went to see the prequels and, and just came out thinking like that just wasn't, it just wasn't Star Wars to me. It just didn't mm -hmm. feel like the Star Wars that I grew up knowing and loving. Um, and then maybe episode seven made, made you feel that a little bit more because, you know, they tried harder to kind of capture that, you know, that, that kind of uh, OG feel. Um, and, you know, but how you do that is not easy, right? Knowing what the constituent elements of, it's not just well, you know, as long as he's got a lightsaber and talking about the force, and there's a guy, there's a black guy, uh, a, a, a dude in a black mask, and that's all okay, you know. So that you, you, it's not just about putting the pieces together. It, you can put the pieces together, but the the pieces that you choose and how you put them together, and this is not just Star Wars. This is really anything. Um, this is equally true in Star Wars. I just went to see Beyond, and I thought they did a really good job of capturing the kind of the Star Wars essence with that in a way that they hadn't in the previous films. Again, all of all of those previous films, like again, think about it, right? There's many, many Star Trek films, and they all have Kirk and Scotty and Spark, and some feel more like they've captured the spirit of Star Wars than others. So the pieces are the same, but more but some are more than the sum of their parts, and some feel like less than the sum of their parts. And so it's how you put them together and how you use them and kind of and in what, you know, it, it, it's kind of like a recipe, right? Too much of this or not enough of that. And it looks like a cake, but when you take when you take a bite, uh, it's something quite there's just something's off. And that's true in storytelling as well. It's very, very hard to get that right. Oh, man. It's going to be so much fun to be in that room and to hear the rejected ideas. In the Star Wars universe and anywhere else, Like, I would just love to know oh, yeah, what doesn't mine. make all of My ideas are all the rejected <laughs> ones for the most part. I can just look through your notebook and have the same uh, everyone, everyone has the everyone has their, everyone has their fair share of rejected ideas. But that's how you get to the good ones, right? There is kind of like a, a round table, a brain trust of people, again, who all... They're all there because they know and care about Star Wars deeply. Yeah. And if an idea can survive that gauntlet uh, and, and end up on the whiteboard and end up in an episode, it's probably a pretty good idea because a lot of people that care about Star Wars have had you know, their opportunity to, you know, to shoot it down if they didn't think it was a good idea. Um, and you know, that's, uh, it's, it's actually part of the reason why I'm trying to get into television more is I love that collaborative process when it's me writing a movie it's literally just me here in this kind of sad uh lonely room kind of walking up and down here wearing out the carpet beating my head against the wall saying i can't do this you're a fraud this is the one where they find out uh you know the emperor has no clothes but when you're in a room with a bunch of like-minded people um you you generally tend to get better ideas and you all kind of become each other's uh support and it's kind of like writers anonymous everyone kind of supports each other <laughs> Um, and there's, you know, no one judges, you know, there's no, one of the, you talk about rejected ideas. One of the rules that you generally have is, you know, you try to say, you know, there are no stupid ideas, right? You'll never criticize, you'll no, no one will ever get shot down for having a stupid idea because if you make, if you're made to feel bad, you might have the next great idea, but ne the next time you won't raise your hand because you're afraid of people making fun of you. Mm -hmm. So even if an idea is terrible, people tend to, you know, but it, even, even a terrible idea could lead to someone else saying, well, not that. But what if you did it like this, and then you get to the great idea? Yeah. And so you know that kind of brainstorming um, is uh, is invaluable. And again, you're increasingly seeing that in in game development. That's how Telltale work, and increasingly how the story departments in video games work now is very similar to uh, television development. So I'm curious, uh, since you're a little bit of a Star Wars expert at this point, what do you consider uh, the best Star Wars games ever made? What do you point to? I have to go. Well, um, let me think. So I I don't think there's been a great one in recent memory like I, said, I didn't like battlefront and there hasn't been a, and there haven't been a ton of star wars games recently like since um you know uh lucas arts went away we just haven't you know until EA, and the ea's come along we've just now started to see the beginning of what they're doing i think you know amy's star wars game is going to be tremendous amy hennig's game i think what you know jade raymond and what respawn are, are, are going to be doing is incredible um but to think of the last great one I would say the last great one was the original Knights of the Old Republic. That yeah. was the last one that I played and played it for hours and hours and end on the original Xbox. And it was the closest I think I've come outside of the films to feeling like I was having a cinematic Star Wars experience in a game. 
Uh, and then prior to that, I would say uh, the X-Wing and Larry Holland's X-Wing and TIE Fighter games are probably the best that we've ever got. But I, if I had to pick like the best Star Wars game of all time period, I'd probably pick KOTOR. Yeah, good choice. You ever talk to the Bioware guys? I've had, I've had little conversations with them. Uh, I really wanted to get into um, the Old Republic. Yeah. Uh, and then when I eventually saw it, it just kind of felt so much. Like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should give it another chance. But it just felt so much like a skinned World of, I was looking to get away from World of Warcraft because it was ruining my life at the time. I was playing like 15 hours a day. I thought, I need something else. Maybe this. And then that came along. I was like, oh, but it's just like World of Warcraft with lightsabers. I may be wrong, but that's kind of what it looked like to me. And so yeah. I was very averse to it. There is great Star Wars content in there, though. I, I haven't played it since it went free to play and whatnot. But uh, like I always hear great stuff about like, the Imperial spy story. Like if you just boil yeah, down so some they have of that lot, content. They have great storytelling in there, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just, it's it's just a little and, buried. And, and, and talk and actually, when we talk about you know great storytelling in games, we should not. I was actually remiss when I didn't mention Bioware before because the amount yeah. the Mass Effect games are in, I, I think are incredible. I'm anxious. If you ask me, like what my most um, and if I get to like wave a magic wand and have like the next game that's not finished yet, like come forward in time and be on my desk right now, I'd probably pick either whatever the next gen whatever the next gen Red Dead game is because you know they're doing it right. Course, whatever that yeah. is. Um, or Mass Effect Andromeda, because I just, I devour those games. I'm, I, I don't do this in any other game, but with Bioware, their world is so rich. Like, I would read every codex entry on every planet that I went to. I'd read the, I'll scroll down and read the whole thing. I just <laughs> loved that world. I just wanted to devour every piece of information about it. And uh, the storytelling is great. Um, you know, again, you really feel like you're making a difference. You know, I, I the way that I, <laughs> I won't. Get, I guess I won't get to do this. Anymore. I don't know if I will or not with the new character. But the way I used always used to play my shepherd was just I would do full renegade, right? Just to make oh, him the biggest badass. dick okay. possible, just super awful to anyone. But by the end, I would start to feel really bad. Oh, this is the and that was the genius thing in Knights of the Old Republic as well. I did the same thing. So I'm going to go full dark side, right? You, there, come, there comes a point where you get to say, okay, here's the you, you get to decide now. You, you, you know, which the paths are going to diverge. Which way do you want to go? I'm going to go. This is going to be fun. Like typically, I think if I really lived in Star Wars, I'd probably more want to be a good guy. You're not legally obligated to say that. You can be a badass. It's fine. No, I'd be a good guy, but it's fun. But, it's, but here's a bit: it's fun to play the bad guy, right? That's why a lot of actors will say it's more fun to play the villain. Yeah, good it's point. more. It's more delicious. Uh, it's fun to pretend to be bad. We want to. We deep down, we all want to be good people, but it's, but that's why it's so much fun to pretend to be bad. So I was going kind of dark side, dark side, and the genius of 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 the the story design in the original KOTOR, and you can go get it on Steam for like two bucks now, I think, like go play it if you never have, is that as you go further down that path and you're being asked to commit to it more and more, the dark side decisions you're forced to make are more and more horrible. Yeah. To the point where you're like, I'm not really comfortable with this, but the kind of the moral lesson is, well, did you, this is, this is the natural end game. This is, this is the kind of the natural extension of the path you committed to, but like being a, being a bad guy, maybe it's not so much fun. Maybe you are going to be forced to do really terrible things. And then you feel that Anakin thing of like, you've gone too far. You can't go back now. Just keep that's plowing right, ahead, That's right. That's right. Unfortunately, again, they, you know, and, and again, very, very brilliantly, they built in the, into KOTOR that opportunity that is so baked into the, again, this one is all about Star Wars DNA, right? I think part of the Star Wars DNA is what we learned from Return of the Jedi is that no matter how far gone you are, there's always an opportunity to redeem yourself at the last moment as Vader, Anakin, you know, famously did. And they, and they came up with a way to kind of make that mo moment work in, KOTOR as well. Again, I felt so terrible about the dark side path that I had gone on that when the game said, you can still be redeemed. I was like, oh God, yes, give me the redemption. I want, to, I want the blue lightsaber this time. Get me out of here, I promise. And it, and it worked brilliantly. So yeah, that was um, a great game. I never played the sequel because I heard it wasn't as good. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's been patched up so many times now by fans, and actually, they just added like widescreen support and controller support on Steam. So it's a good oh, time wow. to go back to it if you want to. Maybe I should check it out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right, I think we've kept you long enough, Mr. Witta. Uh, but really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us, man. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show. Be sure to tune in next week. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody.